Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here today on another episode of Flute Specialists Flute Espresso. And today I am honored to sit here with Lorna McGee, um, the principal flutist of the Pittsburgh Symphony and also flute faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. Hi, Lorna. Hi, Tatiana. Thanks so much for having me on the show. <laughs> and it's lovely to be with everyone. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're so we're so honored to have you here, um, and I hope that a lot of your your fans will be here watching as well. Um, all right, so we'll we'll just get started here. First, I want to mention for everyone who is watching, I do have a really awesome prize here. One of our coffee mugs signed by the one and only. Wait, <laughs> Lorna McGee. Um, so yeah, so all you have to do um, to win this is just comment on the feed and we'll just do a random drawing at the end of this and they'll send it out to you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, the first question I wanna ask you is what projects have you been working on, especially during quarantine? What has the symphony been up to? Just, yeah. Yeah, so something, well, I'll tell you about my own private projects and also the symphony. I'll start with the symphony. So it's slim pickings with the symphony right now. I mean, we have very, very strict safety protocols, which only allow wind players to either play outside at a distance of 10 feet from each other or uh, only having one soloist in the Heinz Hall, our concert hall. So um, for the symphony, uh, I think the last thing I did for them before January was basically in October, you know? And so they have this initiative called Front Row. And so if you go to the PSO website, um, you can register for Front Row and you can see all the old episodes. I think there's a way to do it on Comcast as well. But so, so we did some flute quartets. I did some flute and harp stuff. Um, so just small chamber, uh, chamber ensemble stuff. and. Uh, believe me, it was really hard, you know, to play outside and 10 feet away. So when you've got a flute quartet, you know, you're basically all, more than 20 foot away from the from the fourth player. So um, it was fun to do. And I was glad to be able to make music with with my colleagues. And it was so lovely to see them, but not the ideal circumstances. And so I can't wait for things to get back to normal. Um, but in the meantime, at the symphony, they're doing um, uh, some more recordings, uh, digital recordings. So right now, the strings are working with our principal conductor, Manfred Honig. He came over from Austria, which I really appreciate because to do transatlantic journey in this time is stressful. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so he came over and they're, they're doing some real concerts. Um, uh, I mean, not that the others weren't, but they were sort of more sort of like a little documentary like episode. Th these are going to be more like real concerts, um, strings, percussion, harp, all the people who can wear masks. But thankfully, our management made little five minute slots for solo winds. So I'm recording the um, Carl Gellert Chacon um, next week for one of those episodes. And then they have another little initiative with the radio, local radio, wonderful WQED um, 89.3, our local classical station. They are desperate for more live performances. So I went in in January to the hall. So as a solo wind player, we were allowed to do that and just record for the radio. So I recorded the Dokunani Pasakalia and then this beautiful Blochwitz Saraband, which is a new discovery for me. Um, Lochwitz played in Bach's orchestra in Dresden. He was the second flute, I think, to Buffardin. And he was also a composer. So this wonderful flutist, Anna Garzuli Valgren, has created a little sort of mirror of the Bach partita, but collecting Blochwitz pieces. So there's an Allemande, a uh, uh, Courant, a uh, Saraband, and uh, a, a Bure type, a gigue, a gigue at the end. So it's a beautiful little piece. So. I recorded the Saraband from that and also a Telemann Fantasia. T Telemann Fantasia number nine is one of my favorites. And and the the instruction at the beginning is affectuoso, which means affectionately. And so I, I, I don't know, but during this time, I just find playing Baroque music so satisfying and so comforting. And especially that little Telemann Fantasia really 
I find it just really spoke to me. And I, I, I thought it's like this little letter sent through the centuries, this little affectionate letter that says, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> so, so those are the things I've been doing with the symphony. Um, the musicians, you know, we, we have our, there's the official PSO channels, and then the musicians of the symphony of the PSO have their own Facebook page, and they have, um, we do these little live Facebook concerts um, every Sunday night. So it's SNL, but it's not Saturday Night Live, it's Sunday <laughs> Night Live. And so I've done a couple of those, and I'm doing another one this Sunday if people want to tune in. So it's just a little half hour broadcast from, from this room behind me. <laughs> um, and that's on the Musicians of the PSO Facebook page at 6.30 on Sunday. So we've been doing little things like that. Um, one of my friends in the orchestra uh, was compiling recordings to send to seniors' homes um, so that they, they could um, have music to listen to. So I contributed some things to that. Um, I've been teaching and, um, yeah, various things that have kept me going are just nice challenges, you know, like uh, pieces that I've been able to spend a lot of time with, like the Dohnani Passacaglia, which mm -hmm. I just adore. Um, so just little projects along the way and various master classes and workshops online. It's been nice in a way, a little silver lining has been to work with some of the organizations back in Britain, because, you know, I'm British and Scottish. Mm -hmm. And so I've done some master classes like over in Britain for the Royal Scottish Academy and this wonderful little St. Mary's Music School in Edinburgh and the Royal Academy in London. So it's been nice to do those kind of things too. And then the kind of big project that I sort of started in the summer, I want to write a book about flute playing, but really about breathing and about the Alexander technique and the, the connection of like your breath is your musical medium. So I always say to my students, you know, we're artists of the breath. So the book is going to be called Artists of the, Artists of the Breath, uh, a book of inspiration. Hopefully it will be inspiring. Just And just looking at the connections. So really using the breath in making our peace with, often on the flute we struggle with the breath. I certainly did a lot, you know, running out of breath or feeling like you never have enough when we kind of have this poverty mentality. Mm -hmm. But it's so lovely, like I'm very interested in the Alexander technique and so how you use this instrument. And um, so uh, this is something that actually fascinates me and, and the whole process of making peace with the breathing process and also recognizing it as the raw material for music. I mean, your breath is the music. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be, that's a long-term project started in COVID. <laughs> wow, cool. So well, I'll look forward to answer. <laughs> no, that's awesome. You've been up to so much and we love hearing that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you're from, you're from Scotland. So what was it like moving here and have you been able to travel at all during the pandemic or was it, you know, have you been there recently in the last few years or? Oh. Uh, okay, so I really, really, really miss Scotland, and um, that will always be home. I'm a bit of a nomad, so I lived in Canada for, for many years before coming to Pittsburgh, so I've immigrated twice. <laughs> I have Canadian citizenship, and now I have, um, now I have a green card here in the States. Um, so it's a very interesting process to go through to, to immigrate. Um, if I'd known what an upheaval it was, <laughs> I'm not sure I would. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, uh, it's all worked out all right. So, yeah, so first of all, I moved, well, I moved around a lot. I, I guess I'm a nomad. So when I, I was working in London in the BBC Symphony and then I got a, met my, met my husband. That's why I ended up immigrating to North America because of love. <laughs> so my husband, David Harding is a wonderful viola player. And when we met, he was playing in a, um, wonderful string quartet called the Chester String Quartet based in Indiana. And so we were looking for work in each other's countries. And so I ended up teaching at the University of Michigan for a year. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up moving to Canada. He was offered um, a professorship at the University of British Columbia. So we moved to Canada and sort of made a life there for 12 years. And then we both ended up here in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I 
of course, in, at the Pittsburgh Symphony, and David teaches at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so it all worked out, but um, yes, yeah, not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> immigrating, <laughs> immigrating, essentially two and a half times. <laughs> but uh, but I do, you know, it's it's been very interesting, and I have to say, you know, it's culturally fascinating too. I mean, you think all of these countries, Canada, the U.S., Britain. You know, it's the same language, but culturally, it's quite different. Um, oh. yeah. Sorry, guys, hang on one second. Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. That's okay. That was exciting. All right. So, hope this works. Are we okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. You froze for a minute. Oh, uh, okay. I just want to make sure I'm on the Ethernet here and not on the. Sorry, uh, this will just take a sec. Okay. It should be on the Ethernet. Okay. All right. Let's just keep going and hope for the best. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, just to finish that question, I really, I really miss, um, I really miss Scotland. I was there last, uh, it, not Christmas this year, but the previous Christmas, and mm -hmm. of course, it's it's just not possible. It's just not. I mean, I mean it. Actually, I don't even know if it is technically possible because possible, Britain blocked a lot of flights from other countries and then other people blocked a lot of flights from Britain. And anyway, it's just not safe. So I cannot yeah. wait to go back to Britain. Yeah. And is all of your family over there? Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully that but day I'm will sure come many soon. People are in the same, I'm sure many people are in the same boat, you know, not being able to see mm -hmm. their families. We will get through this. <laughs> yes, yes, sure. definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I did get a question actually about your husband. And since you mentioned him, um, I know you do chamber music with him. So what is that like playing with him? And um, where can we hear your stuff? Where can we hear your music? Oh, OK, uh, so so we had we had a trio called Trio Verlaine. So that's spelled V-E-R-L-A-I-N-E. I think there should be a fair bit of that on YouTube now. I know Heidi Kruitz and the Harpist was putting some of that, some of our recordings up on YouTube. Um, so if you hunt for Trio Verlaine or Heidi Kruitzen, it'll probably show up. Um, so, and their CDs, which should be available in some of the blue shops. So, uh, cause we've made, how many have we made? A couple, we've made a couple of Trio CDs and uh, I've made a Jewel CD with harp and then uh, various other chamber music ones, and then a, a, a one for beat records, flute and piano, uh, called The Hour of Dreaming. Anyway, playing uh, chamber music with David, you know, I know a lot of couples just won't go near that territory of working together, but actually, we, we, we love it. I mean, 
I, I love David's playing. It's just, he makes the most gorgeous sound on the viola. And um, so actually some of those trio concerts that we did were some of my happiest concerts that I've ever done, you know, really great. And, and so we, we just, we just all connected and there was so much trust in that group, you know, trust of each other that you could do, I mean, you could be spontaneous, you could do, we could all do stuff and people would react. It's not like you had to plan it all out and map it all out. I mean, it was such a degree of listening and receptivity and responding that it was just always a joy and it was always different, which I, which I love. I never like music to be like a prescription and just yeah. you kind of regurgitate yeah, I mean, of course, you have to have a plan, but it, you know, I love. I mean, I live for that give and take. Honestly, mm -hmm. that's that's what I think it's all about. And so, so we we had a great time. I mean, the way I, the reason I'm saying saying it all in the past tense is that, you know, we had this trio when we were all in Vancouver, and now we're, you know, we're in Pittsburgh, and Heidi, our harpist, is now the principal harp in the Philharmonia in London. So just the logistics, <laughs> we haven't yeah. played together for quite a while, but. You know, was uh, anyway. I, I still do often play with David at chamber music festivals. Mm. Exactly. Cool. Which I, the chamber secretly, chamber music is my real love. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I like the orchestra too, but I love chamber music even more. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any tips for like chamber musicians or people who are interested in getting into chamber music? Oh. Well, form a great group and be respectful to each other and inspire each other and challenge each other and work really, really hard. And then I think, you know, do chamber music competitions. I mean, that, that would be how you would get a foot on the ladder, you know, so Nomberg, um, you know, things like that. There's not so many options for wins, actually, uh, but, you know, concert artists, uh, things like that, or in, you know, in Europe, there's things like uh, the ARD competition in Munich, you know, for wind quintets that comes up every, I don't know, five years or something like that. So, I mean, if you're serious about, I mean, it's not really that feasible for wind players to have a chamber music career. You can't really, it, that can't really be your bread and butter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, it, 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 so I think there are a few groups that have been really, very fortunate and very savvy and and wonderfully talented like Imani wins or you know there's another wonderful wind quintet wind sync um mm -hmm. i i take my hat off to them but you know that's you have to generate all your work and right. yeah yeah tough, tough road but but a wonderful one too so yeah good <laughs> considering <laughs> that. Yeah. right all right, great. Um, so I think you might have your flute around and we have a flute question for you. Um, just looking for advice on playing pianissimo with an attractive tone. Yeah, I think this is a wonderful question. And um, I think it's, I, I'm so glad that, that somebody asked this. Thank you, for whoever it was who asked this question because um, I think it's really important to learn how to play quietly really, really well. I mean, in the Pittsburgh Symphony, I've had to play quieter than I've ever been asked to play in my whole life. <laughs> so, uh, but but even before that, you know, it's, I remember as a student just thinking, I need, I need to learn how to play quietly really well, because basically not many people bother to learn how to do that. And it's, it's much more comfortable to just wail away at mezzo forte or above and it's kind of more flattering, right? It's a little bit uncomfortable to play piano and, and sometimes it can sound really hissy. So it's so important to learn how to do that really well. So I, I think there's a few components to this. Um, the first is to get the, get the air where you want it. So often I think the, the thing that gets in the, in the way of playing a beautiful pianissimo is just having like a death grip in the embouchure or the jaw or the neck, you know, kind of bracing like you don't want to be too loud, so you sort of brace to play. So so changing that mindset to playing pianissimo is just a modification of your most beautiful forte. And so I, I would get my students to sort of bounce the air on a ha um, and just start off nice and comfortable mezzo forte and then and then just reduce the the size of the bounce. So And 
and until until you get to the sort of uh, range that you want and then just hold it and just hold the line ho ho stand your ground and hold the line and of course to, in order not to go flat when you're reducing the airspeed and and the the energy in the in the bounce um you have to slightly angle the air up the way so if people want to try this if you put your hand in front of your mouth and then you move your airstream up to the top of your fingers that's sort of the direction you want to be going in when you're playing quietly in order not to go flat and in the same way that you can move the air up to the top of your fingers without any stress it's the same on the flute mm -hmm. so i never i never ever think about trying to make a smaller hole or uh, trying to withhold the air because that's not really making music to withhold is not making mm -hmm. music you it's whatever we do it's communicating and it's going this way so um You, know, you can just sit there when you feel like there's the air I need, there's the angle I need not to go f flat, and then just sit there like a little bird in a tree and just think, oh, can I can I release a little bit more? Can I just can I hold my ground here without tension, without brittleness, without bracing? Um, a, a lovely thing to think of is also like to think of the vowel sound ooh. Mm -hmm. So I also the jaw really really relax the the. Um, back of the neck, really relaxed. The, the worst public enemy number one of trying to play quietly is for this to happen. Because that just, you lose your tone immediately there. So thinking, relax the neck, head forward and up, sending the crown of the head up to the ceiling. Relax here, be relaxed here, but accurate and have the right air to back you up. So not trying to just play on muscle, but actually to play on air. Another lovely thing to do is to try, you know, playing, I quite often do this, like taking a high register note, like taking a high B. And breathe in as if I'm going to play something like that. And then play in a lower register. But with that kind of backup of the air inside. So when you're playing quietly, it's as if you take in huge amounts of air as if you were going to play a really high pressure note like a, th a third octave note and it's like the the air inside the ribs you know you want to think of a balloon in there and I, I don't like to think of tension but there is a certain amount of pressure holding the walls of the balloon up and not letting it, them collapse immediately yeah so it's that kind of fine, beautiful, fine balance between the in and the out breath. That's a little bit more um, cryptic, that last thing. But it, it's almost like the in, breathing in mechanism is acting on the breathing out mechanism to slow it down. Mm. You know, but, but there's still yeah. beautiful structure there. Yeah. And you can, um, something else you can try is starting on a P just for practice that so helps the lips not to be too tight. So... I just start with the lips closed and then just let the airstream open the lips so you get a lovely clear sound. So that helps get if there's any excess tension or, or con, uh, contortion in the in the corners, it, it helps do away with that. And then you're just getting the air right and a beautiful form here. So okay. those are the things I can think about. You can also try note bending in quiet dynamics. If you don't know what note bending is, it's, it's something that Tre Trevor Y talks about in his tone book. Um, you start very, very sharp with a very, very smiley face, and then you go very, very flat with a sad face. It doesn't look attractive. <laughs> uh, just wondering about the wisdom of trying to do this online. And it's just wonderful to do that in different dynamics. So if you're having trouble controlling the sound that helps you to get all the overtones in tune. So I quite often will do that, um, you know, at extremes of, of dynamics. So I might do a really loud one and then also super quiet, super quiet note bending. Just, just so we're controlling the, the air. And then this is, this is always elastic and never rigid. Could go on forever.
Oh, so it's yeah. Cut, cut me off. <laughs> no, I could I could listen to that forever. That's amazing. That's yeah. That's that's really wonderful. We're all going to be practicing our pianissimos tonight. <laughs> There's another wonderful one that I love to do, which is you you practice starting with the air way too high. So what I was saying about this, um, start start your engines, but the, have the air at too steep an angle, and then just gradually bring it down till it meets the edge of the flute and just hold your ground there and just stay there and again just see if you can be super relaxed so i'm going to start blowing i mean the air is judging but anyway that's that's a lovely exercise just just bring the air down until until it catches, but don't don't develop it. Just stay there. Anyway, in a relaxed way. Wow, great! Yeah, I, um, <laughs> that's so amazing, and it sounds so beautiful too. Oh, yeah, I would you. say I would say it's definitely something. I feel like I get a lot of tension when I'm playing pianissimo. I'm like trying to hold it back, you know. So that's yeah, really great to hear that. that. I think having the mindset, whatever we're doing, we're communicating. So the energy is going this way and you yeah. don't have to hide your light. It's not like you have to withhold your sound or, or, or it's just a modification of it. And it's still generous. Yeah. Beautiful. Full of life. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. So um, next question. Well, since you have your flute out, tell us a little bit about your flute or flutes and your setup. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. So this is the this is the Altus 1807 AL. There's several different versions of the 1807. I think there's a PS model and an AL model. Uh, this is Altus limited edition. So what does that all mean? And why do I play this flute? So um, I, you know, I grew up in, in Britain, and I studied with William Bennett. And of course, he's, um, he introduced me to the Louis Lot flutes. So I have three of them. I have three Louis Lots <laughs> and an old Bonville flute as well. And I love those old French instruments. So if people are not familiar with that name, um, Louis Lot was a maker in Paris, sort of from the 1860s, 18, I think, I think he started making metal flutes around 1860. And so the three, the three that I have are sort of from about the 1870s and they're stunningly gorgeous instruments. And they're, uh, so Altus did a lot of research into these old Louis lots. And, and incidentally, the original Powell's and Haynes, I believe were, were modeled on the old Louis lots. So the original, those original flutes, like in the early part of the 20th century, the American flutes were all based on the Louis lots. That's my understanding. I hope I'm correct in saying that. So more recently, Altus has um, sort of explored what are the properties of these beautiful old French instruments. So uh, actually, they're very, very light. They're seam tubes, which means they start off with a flat piece of metal and then are, are rolled into the cylinder. And uh, so they have a seam. So uh, most modern flutes are, come already in a cylinder. So they're, they're not seamed. So there's a, a certain method of construction called seamed tube. So that's what this instrument has. Um, not all the Altus flutes have it, but this this one does. And um, they also analyzed the metal. So the, the silver of the old Louis lots was quite impure. Um, so the, the so I guess Altus made their own recipe. <laughs> I don't know the technical details of it, but, but the silver that they use is, um, is their own concoction, sort of inspired by the dirty silver of the old Louis lots. And um, so there's something, it's quite interesting, you know, when, when, I, when I play this instrument, it has a warmth to it that I really love and that reminds me of the, of the Louis lot flutes. I mean, the Louis lots are so gorgeous, but, but they're a little bit of a liability, you know, mechanically, you know, because the mechanisms are, so rickety and so old and you know even when you've had a lot of work done on them and I and I know this is very controversial but I've had the ones I have 
I, I either got them retuned or they, I bought them retuned. So some people believe you shouldn't touch those old Louis lots. You should keep them in pristine condition. And, and there is an argument for that too. And I think I, I see both sides of that argument as, as valid. It's so beautiful to be able to play them. And um, yeah, so certainly that the, the recording I did that's called Teheki with um, flute and harp that I did with my Louis lot. I, I think most of the more recent recordings I've done with my Altus flute. And um, so there's something about the seam tube that gives that warmth. And it's quite interesting because when I've tried other altuses that don't have the seam in them, it's it's quite a brilliant sound and it has got a real ping, but I, I love the warmth of this particular way of constructing it. And I like to, okay, this is a romantic way to think, but you know, like when something has like a beautiful old antique, you know, when when there's a little crack in it, like that's where the light comes through. You know, that's the way I think of the of the scene. And um, so that that gives it this warmth and helps it to ring and to resonate. And then I have a bunch of Louis Lot head joints and a Bonville head joint. And so right now I'm playing not with my normal head joint that I would play in the orchestra, but just for fun, I was mucking around with, with one of the other Louis Lot ones. So I put, I, I put a Louis Lot head joint in it. So you sort of get, the beauty, uh, the best of both worlds, you know. Yeah. And I think it's, I think they're very compatible because of the, the, the whole ethos the, of of the construction of the altus flute. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we actually just got a question in from Adam Stadberry. Hello, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> he said earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that you find inspiration in your chamber music colleagues. Could you talk about one or two other one or two of your other inspiration sources? And that was also a question we got into from a couple That's other a people. That's a great question. So. Um, oh, singers! My goodness, singers! So you know the whole the whole tradition of the the Moist tradition that you know uh, that came over to the states too, and and also with William Bennett, um, you know Marcia Moist. Well, and even going back, you know Taffanel. Really, these people were inspired by the singers. Um, and I, I, I just, I think for me, that is the, the greatest source of inspiration. I just want to be like a, like a great singer. Um, so for example, people I've listened to recently and, and you might enjoy, you know, the listeners might enjoy this too. Um, you can go online, go on YouTube. My favorite people to listen to teach actually, I love listening to master classes with singers. So Thomas Hampson, who is just the phenomenal, a phenomenal singer in his own right, but also a brilliant teacher. And he's so aware, like it's almost like an Alexander Technique lesson, the way he talks. I mean, just this complete and utter unity of the of of of, of physical understanding and then this artistic, um, you know, this beautiful artistic aesthetic, you know, it's completely unified. I mean, his body is the music, and and the way he articulates that in in master classes, and just to hear the effortlessness and the resonance of his voice is phenomenal. One of my other favorites is Joyce Di Donato. I love that woman. Um, so there are many many uh, master classes of her teaching at Juilliard or or the Royal Opera House with young um, up and coming singers there. Uh, so there's no shortage of inspiration from the singers and most recently because I was doing a little interview with William Bennett about the Schubert introduction and variations our beautiful piece um, you know I was listening to different recordings of of great singers singing Trockner Blumen you know I've, I've always loved the Dietrich Fischer Disco one you know that that's I, I think that's very dear to my heart but I found a new one um, with this uh, British British tenor Ian Bostrich it's quite different but it is also um, exquisite and very, very, very vulnerable. So just when you hear people like that, you just think, okay, how do I do that on the flute? You know, how do I get those resonances? How do I, how, you know, how do I get that, maybe that kind of falsetto sound or like just that human expression, how can I get that on the flute? Um, you know, being married to a, a great string player, you know, I'm steeped in, hearing wonderful string players and you know david loves 
uh, he especially loves like some of the historical recordings of the the great violinists like Chrysler or um, I mean, one of my favorites is Yehudi Menuhin, if I could make a sound like Menuhin, or like Oistrakh. Um, but even going further back um, than that, there are, uh, well, there's people like Zigetti, uh, Milstein, uh, uh, Hubei, Hube, Hube, I can't remember exactly how you pronounce his name. Um, so great string players. Um, also wonderful piano players. So one of my very favorites, and you can also listen to master classes of this man online, um, Georgi Shebok. So Shebok is spelled S-E-B-O-K. So S-E-B-O-K. He a, was a Hungarian pianist. He's passed away now. Um, just a phenomenal, phenomenal human being and artist. So I love listening. You know, actually, so it, this relates to the, the pianismo question. I remember hearing Mari Pariah in a recital, you know, the great piano player. And I was so moved by the way he played pianissimo, you know, because there was no fuss. It was just this beautiful, this, this light touch, but no sort of, none of this, you know? And I just thought, actually that, that always stuck with me. I've never forgotten that. I just thought, oh, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that in the musical realm, th those are where I, where I find inspiration. And then, then other, I think one of my big uh, aspirations in life is not, not to put ourselves in too small a box, not to be an instrumentalist, not to be a flute operator, but what, like, what does it mean to be an artist? So I think about questions like that a lot. And I love listening to authors. I love reading novels. I love, I love going to art galleries and things like that, you know, what, what inspired other people and what, what courage to, what incredible courage, like to put that novel on the page. I mean, to take the trouble to do that and put it out there in the world or, or great paintings, you know, what, what motivated people like, I have to do this, you know? And so it, it gives a different context to your own work as well. Mm -hmm. That was a wonderful question, Adam. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I guess to end it with another question, um, just what are a couple of, or what is some advice that you have in staying disciplined, especially nowadays when there aren't as many performances in sight? Um, so, you know, people want to work towards a goal, but in what ways, or how would you, maybe for like young flutists too, like your students, you know, how would you um, help them kind of get through this time? I know. Um, I think I, I think I could offer two two ways of thinking about it. In a way, to reframe it in in one's mind as actually, we'll probably never have this kind of pause again. You know. So mm -hmm. so I think what I don't really like to talk about this time as having gifts about it because it's so awful and so much suffering. But um, I think certainly my own playing is, is given a little bit more space to go a bit more deeply into things. You know, so, so for example, in your own playing, are there things that you would like to sort of get to the bottom of a little bit? So, so for me, it's always, it's, it always comes back to the breathing. So I've been taking several online courses with great Alexander teachers. One's a singer. And then um, another one I'm taking right now um, online with a wonderful teacher in New York. Um, just wh when would I have the time to take these courses and to sort of learn more about this breathing mechanism and, and, and how to deepen your connection with that? Or, um, you know, without having to learn repertoire, you know, with the orchestra week after week, it's kind of been... I've almost never spent maybe quite so much time with some of the pieces that I'm working on right now, but it, but in a way that's quite nice. It's like, oh, you could you could get it another notch, you know, further on than you know get the level up more than you thought you could maybe. So mm -hmm. um, it, 
yeah, we probably won't have this time, or hopefully won't have this kind of big pause in our lives again. So if we can use it um, constructively. So if, for example, you feel like your finger technique is a little bit clunky, or, or your hands are rather tight or tense, or, or, or you're not really happy with your hand position, it's not the most efficient. Well, now, now would be the perfect time to address that. So I, I think we all have weaknesses in our playing. You know, so it's it's a wonderful time just to to explore how can I get those things better so that we come out of this in a stronger position, you know, and with more confidence. And then I think on a more practical level, when there are not the structures in place uh, of concerts, normal concerts, et cetera, et cetera, I think you have to make your structures. So, and make realistic structures and make, um, so for example, even these little Sunday night live concerts have been wonderful things to work towards. Or uh, you could even work up some repertoire and do a Zoom concert for your friends and family, or mm -hmm. or for a senior's home, or so something like that. You know, you could you could you could create the structure, or or simply, you know, make a great recording of a, of things that you're working on. So that, that would help to give a little focal point. So I know many competitions right now, um, of course, well, all the competitions right now, you have to send in recordings. So whether you like doing competitions or not, there's a wonderful focal point of just, okay, I have to make a recording by 18th of February. So then you can kind of marshal your energies. It gives you something to focus towards and then do your best. And it doesn't matter what the outcome is. Like that, that I think, having those little um, stations along the way that those structures help to help you to orient your energies towards something concrete so that it's not just like managing all the time is quite you know the abstract time is quite difficult so just i think trying trying to make your own structures wherever you can or it may be that there are pieces you've always wanted to play and and pieces that are really challenging well why not you know we've got time <laughs> yeah yeah and and to 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 enjoy it i mean i have to say i my flute has been a tremendous comfort during this time i i i have found kind of refuge in practicing you know because it's so familiar and i know how to do it and it it you know when everything else is a bit chaotic and falling apart like this is something I know you know and I I know how to do it and I, I enjoy it so it can also be a great comfort and a refuge and I would say there's there's different components to motivation and I think it's quite good to name them so there's intrinsic motivation or intrinsic joy which is sort of why you started playing in the first place you know why why you pursued this so if I, so, so that can be a beautiful motivator. So sometimes I will just maybe not feel like doing a, a particularly constructive practice, but it might be so enjoyable just to play through, through some Bach. You know, you get can get those compilations of Bach, you know, with all the movements of um, the string, so not, you know, the solo string, cello or violin. You know, just maybe things you are not so familiar with, but it's just so lovely to just, enjoy playing so that's one type of motivation and then there's a what is it task value task value orientation uh, motivation which is what i was talking about like if there's something you want to improve in your playing like there's a certain reward in sort of chipping away at that and that's called task value and that can be so satisfying like something you couldn't do at the beginning and then by the end you can you can do it so that's task value and then the other one is the reward system, where I'm not so sure that that is the the, the sort of um, more, more superficial of them, which is okay. If I do if I do an hour of practice, I can have that glass of wine, <laughs> 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 or I can watch my favorite Netflix. Like, if, but you have to do this first. That, that you know, th those are those are the three different types of motivation. You know, I would say that the first two are the most valuable ones. Yeah. The third one comes in handy at a pinch. <laughs> <laughs> right. I can see that. Yeah. Oh my goodness, Jeff so uh -huh. Oh, I just saw a pinch. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lorna. Um, before we go, 
I'm just gonna, we're gonna do a fun this or that round, our Flute Espresso Express round. So I'm just gonna give you just two options and you can pick one or the other. You can pass if it's like super controversial, but hopefully okay. nothing too bad. Okay. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so wind quintets or string quartets? String quartets every time. Yeah, we already knew that too. <laughs> okay, um, dogs or cats? Dogs, definitely. Good, okay, um, movies or books? Books. Okay. Um, summer or winter? What well, depends. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna, this is conditional. Scottish summer, okay. Pittsburgh summer, not okay, it's too hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, Firebird or Petrushka? Oh, Petrushka. Uh, Taktakishvili or Prokofiev Sonata? Prokofiev. Oh, I like, oh, these are difficult ones. I love them. <laughs> we just take all of them. I know. <laughs> uh, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Piccolo or alto flute? <gasps> Always the alto flute. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then last one, Beethoven or Brahms? Oh, I, I, I'm not going to decide. I'm going to take 